Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video, who offers thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including photography, illustration, design, filmmaking, and much more. Over the last four years of making videos about film photography, I've tried my fair share of different cameras. Normally, I only own a camera for a fairly brief period of time, as I trade it on to try something new. In this series, I'm going to be giving you a look through my personal camera collection, the ones that didn't get stuck on eBay. Yet. I'm going to shoot a roll through each one and give you an overview of why I think it's worth owning. So this, without a doubt, is my favourite camera I've ever used. This particular camera is a Chamonix 8x10, but to me, the camera model isn't necessarily the most important. It's more so just 8x10 large format. And this is just because large format is essentially a big light type box. It doesn't necessarily matter which make and model you've got. They're all pretty similar. As long as it's not too heavy to carry and it's precise, I don't mind too much. Like look, this one really is a couple of bits of wood, a bit of carbon fiber, a bit of glass, and some accordion looking fabric in between to make sure it's all light tight. It really is photography in its most simple state. There's no mirrors, nothing fancy. It's just simple. So this is what I look like when I'm going out to take a photo. It's uh, quite the camera bag not the most practical. And all that translates into this. Give or take a few accessories like light meter, loop, shutter release, dark cloth, film holders. You know, there's a few other things you need to take a photo, but <laughs> I mean, the bulk of it is this camera and lens. And that's not even the worst of it. Sometimes when I take a photo, I look like this. Mamma mia. And of course, if you're gonna use it like this, you need some form of step ladder. Um, probably one even bigger than this. Uh, Here's a photo of when I've done it in the past. And I've also done it on the roof of a car. You know, large format has huge benefits when you can get as high as possible. Uh, the, the higher the vantage point, normally the better the photo comes out. But then of course, carrying around this on top of all of that camera kit only adds to the kind of problems of using it. But I think that's often why this camera has been used by so many great American road trip photographers. There's a huge difference between working in the UK and America in that when I started using this camera, even though I can drive, a lot of the photos I was making, I was walking to, which is a huge amount of effort. Whereas if you're working with the kind of classic American road trip style, you don't really walk that far from the car. You kind of post up and take a photo. All of it's in the boot. So since currently, I can't go out and take some sample photos and show you the exact process of using this camera, I thought instead it would be fun to take a look at my archive and show you some of my favourite photos I've taken with it, but also try and shed a bit of an understanding upon why I choose to use it, because quite obviously it's not the most practical way to make photos. It'd be a lot easier to take a significantly smaller camera. So I'm guessing there's some sort of reasoning behind what makes it worth it. I think the first easy to recognise reason why it's so great is detail. The bigger the negative, the more detail you can capture with your camera. And that's seen pretty clearly in this photo of this tree etching of a flag. It just would not be possible to capture this level of detail on any other camera. It's so sharp and rich, and you really feel like you just can get sucked into the image and stare at it for ages. I printed this image at 50 inches by 40 inches before, which it kind of towers over you, and it's still incredibly sharp. That's not even really pushing the limits of how big you could print. This also makes it great for landscapes, like this one of Port Talbot. It really helps to just cram as much detail into a photo as possible. And I think in this photo, that makes it feel like it's like a model village. It doesn't make it look kind of real. If you took this on medium format instead, it definitely wouldn't have the same kind of look. The next great thing which comes with large format is depth. As your film gets bigger, you need to use a longer focal length to get the same field of view. So a 300mm lens is the equivalent of a 50mm on a full frame or 35mm camera. But it still has the depth as if you were using a 300mm on a full frame camera. So the depth of field, the bokeh, is insane. The, the widest aperture on my lens is f5.6, which might seem not very shallow, but let me tell you, it is. 
And this allows you to create some fairly unrealistic looking scenes, like this one of the burnt out smart car. You wouldn't be able to isolate the scene like this in any other format. And what I really love about this is that you can give an item, uh, an element of the photo context with the background, but also still kind of put the spotlight on it by separating it from the background. So you can see where this car was burnt out. It's in the middle of a car park by a field in suburbs. The background doesn't become distracting since the car is still so isolated. This is also apparent in this photo of Roger looking up at all these flags on his apartment blocks. You couldn't get this depth any other way. And what I really love about this photo is it almost makes it look not real. You know, it makes it look once again like a doll's house or a toy kind of photo, but at the same time super realistic since there's so much detail. It's a, it's a strange thing. It's hard to explain, but when you see these photos up close, it you, you can kind of get it, or at least I can. And then like this photo of Captain Beanie. I think for environmental portraits, large format is kind of the the best. It's the peak. It you can capture the scene and the subject in such a harmonious way where just the depth of field is it's there's so much to it, you know, you can still make stuff out. The subject remains super, super detailed. And the final reason, which I think is a huge bonus to using large format is the camera movements. This allows you to play with the focus, whether you want to get an image which is completely in focus, a pin sharp image from edge to edge, or you want to get a super shallow photo, but still remain perfect focus on your subject. Like a photo of these two guys, Josiah and Asher. And what I did here was use some front swing on the camera to get both of them perfectly in focus, even though they're not standing side by side. Normally, your lens on your camera is flat. You know, it's, it's straight on, it's parallel to your film. But with large format, what you can do is you can take the front of the camera and turn it. And what this does is change the plane of focus. So in this case, since they're both standing staggered like this, I moved the lens in accordance, got them both in focus, and was able to take a photo which still had a shallow depth of field, yet both of them were perfectly in focus. Or another example of two faces that are staggered, where I focused on one of the eyes, tilted it until the other eye was in focus, and took the photo. And it just makes for such a nice photo, in my opinion. And this can be done in many different ways. It doesn't have to be two subjects. It could be one subject, in this case, this guy laying down, and what you can do is push the lens forwards, so that the whole face from top to bottom remains in focus. Or for instance, this guy feeding his baby, I focused on the top of his head, tilted it to his shoes, changed the aperture until both everything seemed to be in focus, and managed to capture him and the baby perfectly sharp, yet the background still fading away. I don't think this photo ever would have happened if it wasn't for this camera. It has this bonus of being unusual that if I went up to this guy feeding his baby on a park bench and said, can I take a photo of you? And I was holding a DSLR or an iPhone, he never would have said yes. He, he would have been freaked out and thought it was really strange. But because I had this crazy old looking wooden box that it's just like, it's such a rare thing for that to happen. But it feels like a special occasion for your subject as well, which makes them more likely to say yes and you to have these awesome encounters with strangers. It just makes that a bit easier. And if you're a bit of a shy person and you struggle talking to strangers and asking to take their portraits, having a really unusual camera like this, it starts the conversations for you. I think pretty much all of my favorite photos I've ever taken have been on this camera. And what's great is also that it's by far my favorite camera to use. It goes hand in hand that I have the most fun taking the photos, but I also like the results the most. Obviously, there is a pretty huge downside to using this camera, which comes in the cost. These cameras alone are expensive. You also need a really expensive tripod to be able to carry such a camera since it's so heavy. You also spend a lot of money on film. A colour photo for this camera, one sheet of portrait costs around £20. Comes in boxes of 10, spending at least £200 every time you want to take maybe 10 photos. It's pretty expensive. I've got around this in the past by buying a bunch of expired film at really good rates, but it's not for everyone. On the upside though, black and white film is a lot more affordable, which is what I'm mainly interested in shooting now. It had actually been a while since I took a photo of this camera when I got it out for this video. And filming this just made me realize how much I really do miss shooting with it. 
and I really can't wait until I can go back outside and continue some of the projects I'm working on. I actually have a little list of photos I'm planning on taking as soon as the restrictions decrease and I'm allowed to head out and I'm going to be filming videos all about that process. So stay tuned for that. And finally, I'd like to thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers membership to a vast variety of online classes across a bunch of different fields. Whether you're interested in learning a bit more about photography or filmmaking, or you want to pick up something completely new, Skillshare has got you covered. My good friend Dan Rubin has a few classes on photography, but there's also a bunch more whether you want to learn about lighting or Photoshop. And another class I can recommend is Ryan Booth's DIY Cinematography. There's a bunch to learn here from practical skills about making video to lighting and cinematography, and it's just so helpful to learn from someone with so much experience and knowledge. But what's amazing is this is just the tip of the iceberg. There really is so much more to explore. I've pretty much learned everything I know about making videos and photos from the internet. When I was younger, I'd spend countless hours watching tutorials, and that's pretty much how I picked up everything. And if Skillshare existed when I was that age, there's no doubt I would have been spending countless hours just trying to improve. It really is an amazing resource for someone that's proactive and trying to learn. There's no ads and they're always producing more premium classes and it's less than $10 a month if you sign up using the annual subscription. So if you want to check out Skillshare, the first 1,000 of my subscribers, to click the link in the description or get a free trial of the premium membership so you can explore your creativity.